Uh, the newspapers are closing, they're going bankrupt, they're laying off people at unprecedented rates. Uh, their revenues are down, their circulation are down. Uh, this is unquestionably the darkest moment in newspaper publishing in the nation's history. There are a couple of real causes. The first one <clears throat> starts with the corporate conglomeration control over daily newspapers beginning in earnest in the 1960s, accelerating through the 70s and 80s. Uh, this really put us on the sort of path we're on today because what this did is it had devastating implications for journalism. Increasingly what we saw were newspapers were local monopolies, part of large corporate chains, uh, which were obsessed with maximizing profits, and these were extraordinarily lucrative local monopolies until quite recently. Even today, at the operating sense of some newspapers make money, uh, still make profits, but until quite recently, newspapers were arguably among the three or four most lucrative industries and in operating uh, profits in the entire country. Um, and these huge chains buy newspapers, uh, and they would milk them. They'd pay a fortune for them, then they'd milk them to make as much money as possible. And the surest way to milk it when you have a monopoly in a town is to lay off reporters. Cut back on the, the, the red ink of editorial staff and replace it with fluff syndicated fare. And that began in earnest in the 1980s. A study by the Society, uh, the Project for Excellence in Journalism, looked at the number of working journalists in Philadelphia in the mid-1980s and compared it to the number of working journalists in Philadelphia 20 years later in 2006. And it saw that there was a 50% reduction in the number of professional journalists in Philadelphia in a 20-year period, a 50% reduction. Just that many fewer reporters covering that community. And it wasn't because journal media wasn't profitable for those 20 years. It was because largely monopolistic or semi-monopolistic owners could get away with laying off reporters and not replacing them. They could pocket some money in the near term, and they didn't really worry about what was going to happen to the franchise down the road. Just the great line goes, in the long run, we'll all be dead. And they were going to take theirs right now while they could get it. And that's what they've done. Another reason why we shouldn't blame the internet for the decline of newspapers and journalism, newspaper ad revenue began to fall back in 1990 as a percentage of advertising spending, long before the World Wide Web. And in fact, if you look at um, journalism criticism, by 1990, 1991, a number of major editors had already quit the industry. People like Jim Squires, Booth Kimball, uh, Doug Underwood, John McManus, had quit the industry basically in protest to corporate cutbacks, the, the, the slashing and burning of newsrooms by corporate owners to make as much money in the near term as possible. So this crisis starts there. But in a way, it doesn't even start there. Because by the logic of that argument, let's just go back to the 1960s and recreate that wonderful system and live happily ever after. Even in the 1960s, the journalism we had then uh, was flawed. It was professional journalism at its high point, but it still was, uh, was, was a journalism that had its limitations. In professional journalism, I mean, the core limitation it has that we deal with every day still to this point, and the, the one we should, you can all instantly recognize if you start being a critical media reader, is that for political coverage, professional journalism has the value that you basically report on what people in power say, and that's credible official journalism. And debates are legitimate as long as they're made by people in power. So it's a very carefully constrained. You're being objective. Like I'm objectively reporting what the Democrats say and the Republicans say. I'm factually accurate. Therefore, I'm neutral. But if you stand back, then you're not neutral. You're reporting what people in power are saying and ignoring everyone else in society in any criticism. What if people in power agree on something? What if, as is in the case of the United States, People in power in this country, both Republican and Democrat, think the United States has a 007 right to invade any country it wants at any time. Do we think that? So Barack Obama thinks that. All the leading Democrats think that. All the Republicans think that. If they want to invade a country, they're going to darn well do it. We've done that for 60 years. Well, that's not debated in our news media. That's simply an off-limits question. It's assumed we have the right to invade countries. Uh, is that objective? Well, if you're living in another country, it isn't. So why is that? We don't assume that Mexico can invade any country it wants. We don't assume Nigeria can or India. No, we're the only one or any country we deputize. But objective journalism makes us seem that that's the way it should be. In fact, all that means is under the guise of being neutral, you're just spoon feeding debates within the elite of a society. Well, there, where do we go? And the good news is that I think we're, we're in, in times where we can actually take advantage of this crisis and create a really viable, credible journalism. Uh, like I talked about at the beginning, with real professional paid journalists in competing newsrooms, uh, merging with citizen journalists and, and the internet to produce a much more democratic, much higher quality journalism than we've had in the United States for a very long time, really forever, because we've never had a chance of this sort of democratization 
of information. But we, what we have to do is come up with resources, policies that channel resources in such a way to create that sort of system. And what do we want to, where do we want to end up? I think where we want to end up is <clears throat> where we have multiple independent newsrooms in communities of well-paid journalists uh, competing who are accountable um, and so that we have people doing journalism in every community. We'd like these newsrooms, ideally, and these media to have a range of political views, with some being more aggressively nonpartisan than others. Some can be more partisan. Uh, it's not that everyone should be partisan or nonpartisan, but everyone should be frank about where they're coming from. Uh, we need different ownership models. We should not have a centralized system or system that has one type of structure for all. Part of the problem of the corporate system is everything was the same structure, so it easily became centralized and consolidated. So we need some commercial ownership, maybe some staff ownership, municipal ownership, nonprofit ownership. We need to experiment. But diversity in ownership in institutional structures is imperative to safeguard uh, any sort of centralization over our journalism or control. There should be absolutely no censorship, but there also has to be strong limits on commercial influence. So what do we do? I'd say we have two stages, the way to look at it. First, in the near term, we need an immediate, immediate crisis uh, journalism stimulus to address the, the, the free fall journalism is going through in this country, the rapid loss of jobs. We, this isn't one where we can appoint a commission, have them come back in three years, make recommendations, have another commission study the recommendations, and then 27 years from now say, okay, let's do this. We don't have the luxury of time. This is much more like Pearl Harbor. That's the sort of response we need. You know, we just got attacked. What are we going to do before we get attacked again? Because if we get attacked again, we might not respond. We might be done. And what we need is there will be another stimulus bill as our economy is continuing south. Uh, there will almost certainly be another stimulus bill. If President Obama wants to serve a second term. Or members of Congress want to get reelected in 2010. And when it is, I think this time, much like we'll need pandemic money in it, I think we're going to need journalism money, much more uh, than we had the first time. And we need to think about ways we can use uh, federal spending and spending in an enlightened way to, to keep journalism going and to start turning the corner. Here's a few ideas we've had. Let's eliminate all postage for any periodical with under 25% advertising for the next three years, just for starters. So any publication that comes out at least four times a year, if you're under 25% advertising, good news, you're for free. All those magazines, all those newspapers, if you're in the mails, you get a free ride. How much that'll cost us? That'll cost, uh, from my research, at most, even if it's taking advantage of liberally, $50 million a year. At most. $50 million a year. I mean, Guy Thner doesn't even bend over to pick up $50 million on his way to, to meet Bernanke at the Fed. I mean, $50 million to let every newspaper magazine that wants to go through the mails go for free for a year? That's for the price of democracy. That's chump change. That's nothing. Here's another one. Let every American take $200 off their taxes and use it as a subscription to any newspaper of their choice. It's an option. They don't have to do it if they don't want to. If they want to, they can support any newspaper they want. And it's not taxable income. It's taxes. So it's a direct government subsidy, but the government has no control over who gets the money. It's all your choice. If you don't want to do it, you don't have to. If you want to do it, you do. It's your choice. But that might mean suddenly they can go into a community and get people to give uh, money to newspapers that are going under to keep those newsrooms alive. Or people could start a newspaper. You don't like the Milwaukee Journal? Maybe you can get 10,000 people in Milwaukee to give their $200 to you. Well, do the math. 10,000 by 200, that's $2 million. How many journalists can you hire for $2 million? Enough probably to cover an area pretty well. Uh, but that would give a public subsidy but with no control over the editorial content. Um, I wouldn't let that subsidy go to for-profit newspapers for more than three years. I'd put a strict limit on that, uh, just to keep those newsrooms alive while they segue out to something different or better. But I keep it open for nonprofit media forever. Third, I think we should seriously ramp up the money going to high school and college media. Uh, you know, part of the problem we have in, with declining youth involvement is that there's much less uh, youth journalism than it used to be. And all the research shows that people who do media, who do journalism, are much more appreciative of it. Uh, than people who have no experience with it or just deal with it as sort of abstract consumers. 